Um, I'm very glad to be at Virtual International Day of the Midwife this year. I'm a little bit nervous as I've never done this before, so we'll just he we'll just have to see how it goes. So as uh, as Halima said, I am a third year student midwife at Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen in Scotland. And this presentation is about supporting survivors of childhood sexual abuse and providing them with um, the best possible midwifery care. Okay. So, childhood sexual abuse, also known as CSA, is any act that involves a child for the sexual gratification of another person, whether or not it is claimed that the child in question either consented or assented. Um, prevalence is very difficult to determine because many children will not report the abuse at the time. Uh, either because they have been bullied or threatened into silence by their abuser or because they do not understand the situation and they do not know that there is anything wrong with the situation. However, the NSPCC uh, estimates that 1 in 20 children in the UK will be sexually abused. Uh, statistics vary. There are other studies that show that uh, possibly as many, of, as many as 20 percent of women will suffer sexual abuse before the age of 18. Um, therefore, it is safe to assume that many midwives throughout their career will look after women who are survivors of childhood sexual abuse, and a lot of the time they will do so without knowing it. Uh, so, childhood sexual abuse has long-term, or can have, very often does have, long-term effects on survivors' lives. Uh, in particular, when it comes to pregnancy and the perinatal period, specific issues include uh, a higher frequency of preterm labour, a uh, higher incidence of teenage pregnancy, which is a lot more common in survivors of abuse, both physical and sexual abuse, than in the general population, and of course perinatal mental health issues. Um, these include anxiety and stress during pregnancy, um, exacerbation of PTSD, of pre-existing PTSD, retraumatization, which can occur as a consequence of an association between pregnancy and the previous abuse, and postnatal depression in the postnatal period. So there are some needs, although of course all women are different, there are some needs that are common to many survivors. Um, providing trauma-informed care can help minimize adverse effects, it can help minimize re-traumatization and can also reduce the incidence of mental health issues during and after pregnancy. Uh, it's important for midwives to remember that many uh, CSA survivors will have developed an aversion to being touched uh, in any way and specifically in intimate ways such as during a vaginal examination. Um, it's therefore very important for midwives to um, explain procedures to, to women and to give them multiple opportunities to uh, give consent or to withdraw consent at any time. Um, it's also important that midwives bear in mind that you can refer women to perinatal mental health services for support if women wish to attend. More specifically, there are two themes that are very common when it comes to um, CSA survivors and pregnancy, and those themes are feeling safe and feeling in control. Um, many CSA survivors link the concept of maintaining control over what is happening to them, over what is happening to their body, with feeling safe. Um, Lack of control, which can sometimes happen in a clinical setting when uh, the, the clinical professional takes over control over the situation and the person, the woman, feels that things are happening to her rather than her being an active participant in the situation. Um, in a situation where there is lack of control, this can trigger um, this can trigger flashbacks as it can trigger an association with uh, the abuse that, they have, that the people have suffered. Um, 
because of course it, it mirrors the situation of abuse in which indeed they did not have control over what was happening to them. So as we said before, someone when will not disclose their abuse ever to their midwife or to anyone else. Therefore, lots of midwives will look after CSE survivors without knowing that they are doing so. And since there is no way of knowing if the person you have in front of you is a CSE survivor, uh, midwives are recommended to use universal precautions to mitigate trauma, such as never assuming consent, um, explaining procedures to women so that they can have a clear idea of what is going to happen, and offering uh, multiple opportunities to withdraw consent at any time if the situation is, um, is becoming too stressful for them. It is also important to give opportunities to disclose. Some women will wish to disclose, are happy to disclose um, their abuse to their midwife. Other women will choose not to do so. Other women, it is important to note that they will not remember the abuse at the time and therefore they cannot disclose it because they have no memory of it. Um, other women will remember it but will need, uh, will either choose not to disclose it or will need to develop a relationship, a trusting relationship with their midwife before they decide to disclose. And this is where continuity of care comes in because of course, if you build a close relationship between mothers and midwives. If mothers um, see the same midwife all the time and are able to, throughout their pregnancy and birth and postnatal period, and are able to uh, build um, a trusting relationship, it is, of course, more likely that they will then feel safe enough to disclose their abuse. It's important that midwives listen to women because they will sometimes not disclose outright, but they might give um, hints or cues or clues that might put the midwife that might make the midwife aware of the fact that there might have been abuse there uh, for example in some cases um, one midwife reported in a study that a woman she was looking after uh, was very decided upon having a, an elective cesarean section and then of course that that made the midwife um, aware that there might be something going on there and she gently uh, probed and questioned the, the woman around this and then the woman decided to disclose her abuse. So it, it, it can be something quite different from an outright disclosure, but um, we all we all know as midwives how important it is to, to listen to what women say and hint to and especially what women don't say sometimes. Uh, it's very important for midwives to give to provide women with real choice when it comes to place and mode of birth. Some women um, who have survived childhood sexual abuse um, will want a home birth. It is actually more likely for them to want a home birth than the general population. And they are also more likely to give birth at home unassisted if they don't feel that they have the support that they require from the maternity services. Um, conversely, other women might not want uh, to have a vaginal birth at all and will request an elective caesarean section. And of course, it is important that midwives listen and advocate for the women in whichever situation. Um, women may benefit from referrals to perinatal mental health services, as we said earlier, but it is important not to assume that all women will want to talk about their abuse in counselling or therapy, as they, they might have done this, they might have done this previously, they might have um, come to terms with their abuse and they might not require any more, any more counselling or therapy, or they might just not want to do it. So some legal aspects. This, of course, is based on UK law and in particular Scottish law uh, because it is based on what the um, Sexual Offences Scotland Act says. So according to the Scotland, the, the Scottish Sexual Offences Act, there are many forms of abuse that are criminal offences. And this is important to note because some women may not know that what they suffered was abuse. 
uh, and that it was a criminal offence. Some people will think that only rape constitutes um, constitutes abuse and is a criminal offence. In actual fact, there are lots of forms of abuse that are indeed criminal offences, and even when it is not physical abuse, it is still a criminal offence, such as um, showing sexual images to a child, um, indecent communication with a child, flashing, uh, forcing a child to be present during sexual activity or forcing a child to masturbate. Um, even though the children in those particular situations have not been physically touched by the by their abuser, those are still forms of abuse and are still criminal offences. Um, the dangers of implied consent. Now, normally, legally, there would be three ways of evidencing consent for a procedure, which are in writing, by word of mouth, and implied consent. So implied consent is, for example, if you are going for a blood test and you hold out your arm for the person to put a tourniquet on your arm and take your blood. Um, this is particularly dangerous and it can be particularly triggering for uh, CSA survivors because studies report that uh, CSA survivors might initially give consent and then find themselves in a situation where they cannot cope um, and are either become very distressed or are forced to disassociate in order to cope with the situation. So it is very important that consent is gained explicitly at all times and that women um, can always have the opportunity to withdraw consent at any time for whatever procedure. Again, more legal aspects. The right to a home birth. Now, the, um, the Human Rights Act has Article 8, which is the right to private and family life. And there was a European Court of Human Rights ruling uh, that um, declared that this right extended to the right to a home birth. Uh, the right to request a caesarean section. Now, uh, this can be linked to Article 3 of the Human Rights Act, uh, which states that nobody shall be subjected to torture or cruel and unusual punishments. And while, of course, a vaginal birth might might not be seen as torture um, by lots of people, uh, for women who have survived childhood sexual abuse, the idea of a vaginal birth may well be viewed as an endurable torture, and therefore they might they might request a cesarean section. Um, again, this is specific to Scottish law again because it's the Patient Rights Scotland Act in 2011 that states that when providing health care, that we don't like using the word patient in midwifery, but it still applies to us. Um, patients' um, individual and particular circumstances must be taken into account when providing health care. And this very much applies to the particular set of circumstances that come with being a, a survivor of um, childhood sexual abuse. So in midwifery, we, uh, we uh, often talk about the four ethical principles of beneficence, non-maleficence, justice and respect for autonomy. And these can all be linked to providing care for CSA survivors. So in the case of beneficence, um, midwifery care, appropriate sensitive midwifery care for CSA survivors can actually help them heal. Uh, it, can, it can help women um, challenge um, unhealthy abuse-related behaviours. Uh, and it can it can help them um, make peace with with their with their body with with what with positive things that their body can do. Um, some studies even report that breastfeeding, um, which can be problematic, it can be triggering, but it can also be viewed as a means of healing, because it is a very concrete way of showing women that their body can actually produce something good that their their body can do something good because it can um, it can feed another human being. So in this case, uh, midwives need to provide women with every opportunity to facilitate this, to facilitate a journey of healing during the perinatal period. And again, of course, this is um, more possible when, um, when you have continuity of care and you see the same midwife all the time. Non-maleficence, so avoiding reenactment of abuse. Now, we spoke about the potential for re-traumatization. So, uh, in some cases, midwifery care can inadvertently um, 
be very triggering and provide um, provide uh, triggers and um, occasions for women to actually relive their abuse. And it is very important to to prevent this, to, so to be very mindful of what can um, can be a trigger for for CSA survivors. Justice. Now, um, a lot of the time, um, since it is very common for um, abusers in these situations to have been men, uh, women who have survived childhood sexual abuse will request only female staff to be present during the birth. And this is often unfairly ignored because it, you know, it can be dismissed with, oh, you know, the on-call registrar is a man, she'll just have to put up with it, she'll just have to make do. Um, no, this is not okay, because it can be extremely, extremely triggering um, uh, for for survivors to have to, um, to have to be in contact with, with male staff. Respect for autonomy. So, it is important to um, consider survivors' pr uh, particular perception, perception of pain because some women will find, for example, vaginal examinations extremely painful. Now, for women who have not suffered sexual abuse, this might not be the case. It is quite usual for um, vaginal examinations to be uncomfortable but not downright painful. However, for women who have suffered uh, especially if the if the sexual abuse they suffered as children um, was penetration, uh, a vaginal examination can be excruciatingly painful. And it is very important to respect this perception of their pain, to not force through it and to listen to them, to absolutely respect their autonomy in saying, this is too painful for me, please stop. So, when it comes to psychological effects of childhood sexual abuse, um, we know that there are a series of uh, effects on everyday life. So uh, many CSA survivors will have medically unexplained, medic medically unexplained symptoms, such as chronic pain, in particular chronic pelvic pain, other physical symptoms such as headaches um, and uh, bowel symptoms, irritable bowel syndrome, for example. And this could be somatization, so the physical expression of emotional pain. Um, other psychological issues uh, that survivors may, um, may experience are anxiety, depression, and panic disorders, which are common. PTSD, of course, can be quite common. And um, then there are other um, effects that are noted are phobias, eating disorders, um, personality disorders, dissociative disorders, and self-harm and suicide attempts are also, are also quite common. When it comes specifically to the perinatal period, um, fear of childbirth was found to be very common in, in one study um, and there are very, various um, aspects of birth that uh, survivors may fear. Um, they may fear staff or the clinical environment itself. This can be either because they feel intimidated by people who are perceived to be in a position of authority or because they were subjected to forensic examinations as, as children at the time of their abuse and they associate the clinical environment with this. Um, they can fear nakedness, male staff, uh, pain, uh, needles used for taking blood samples and sometimes the birth itself. Dissociation is common during birth um, and this can involve the women reporting either the lower half of their body or sometimes the entire body as being somewhere else. They can report sort of seeing themselves from the outside and their mind being somewhere else. Um, flashbacks are common. Some women may have flashbacks of their abuse for the first time during birth, and this can be very, very upsetting and disconcerting. Um, when women disassociate, um, you may see them um, with their gaze fixed on the ceiling, talking in childlike voices or saying things that they would have said to their abuser at the time. This can be very distressing for staff as well. Um, of course, there is the potential that there can be a negative impact for um, on the whole uh, pregnancy, birth and 
breastfeeding and postnatal experience because uh, again we were talking about control so women may feel that um, the baby inside of them is taking over control of their body and of course uh, the, the the pain that they may feel during labor can be associated with the pain that they felt during the abuse and um we there there may be significant issues with breastfeeding because particularly if the abuse involved the breasts at the time uh women may feel that breastfeeding their baby is inappropriate sexual contact and may feel very guilty about this although as we said there's also a study that says that it can actually be a means of healing so breastfeeding can actually can actually help of course again this is all very dependent on um, on the support and, and the relationship between the mother and the midwife. And of course, as we said earlier, postnatal depression is very common in um, CSA survivors. When it comes to the sociological side of things, um, CSA survivors tend to self-isolate due to shame. So women and people who have been um, sexually abused as children often feel very strong shame about what has happened to them um, and therefore they may decide not to it interlinks with the reasons why they do not disclose the abuse because they're very ashamed of it they can be very ashamed of it um, and uh, in one study there was a, a woman who was reported as saying that you just want to curl up and be part of the wallpaper um, this is an excellent example of of um, self-isolation um, due to shame you just want to blend in you just want to be normal you don't want such a fuss made you just want to be absolutely normal and for nobody to ever to ever know or suspect anything um the reasons why survivors do not disclose their abuse are varied as we said before but there are also sociological reasons which include the fact that there can be a very strong sexuality taboo so a, a very strong taboo around everything relating to sex um and some people find that this taboo is so strong um, in their social in their social circle that they that they feel that they cannot talk to it. They feel that they have nobody to talk to. And when this occurs in the family circle, and this is coupled with lack of um, sexual education in schools, uh, this can mean that sexual abuse survivors have absolutely nobody that they feel that they can go to because sex is just not talked about. Um, a further aspect is the continued stigma that exists around um, mental health and motherhood. So some women will choose not to disclose or will try to hide the fact that they that they do have that they do indeed have mental health issues um, because they fear that they're going to be stigmatized and labeled as bad mothers for having mental health issues and therefore they try and 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 hide everything to do with everything to do with the abuse and the consequences of the abuse that they have suffered. So what can we do? Sensitive midwifery care. Uh, sensitive midwifery care, we know, of course, is important in any situation and for everyone that we look after as midwives. It is particularly important for people who feel that the overwhelming need to feel safe and in control of what is happening to them in their birth experience. So advocacy is extremely important. We talked earlier about um, women's wishes to either have a home birth or to request an elective caesarean or to not have male staff pre present at the birth. Um, again, this links with continuity of care. So if women have a strong relationship with their midwife, if they know their midwife and they trust their midwife, um, it is important for them to know that the midwife can be an advocate for them and can, um, and can provide care which is based on their particular needs and wishes. Um, of course, we know that women-centered care is important uh, for everyone, but again, in particular for CSA survivors. Um, the example, Liz Garrett in her, in her book about um, midwifery care for, sexual, uh, for childhood sexual abuse survivors, um, talks about the fact that some women report that the same procedure carried out by two different midwives can have um, radically different effects. So, for example, a vaginal examination, um, if, the, 
if the midwife is attentive to the woman's needs and to her cues and to what is going on with the woman in that particular moment, the vaginal examination, which she found so traumatic, performed by somebody else, can actually be a lot less traumatic and maybe not traumatic at all. So the attitude of the midwife um, putting the woman in the centre is um, can make all the difference in this case. In, in all cases, but in particular in this case. Um, the midwife mother relationship. So we know we know there is a wealth of evidence about trust and and partnership in building the relationship between uh, the mother and the midwife. And of course, again, this is particularly important um, when it comes to labour and birth for for um, women who have survived childhood sexual abuse. So in particularly in particular, the second stage of labour when vaginal pain is present. Um, it is important that women who associate vaginal pain with their previous abuse feel safe enough in the care of their midwife to let go and just succumb to that because as we know that is when that is when the baby will actually um, be born. So it is extremely important that um, women who associate vaginal pain with abuse are actually nurtured and feel safe enough in the care of their midwife to allow this to happen. Uh, spiritual midwifery is the branch of midwifery that of course um, views um, birth and motherhood as a rite of passage really and this can be as we touched upon earlier this can be um, particularly important for women who are survivors of childhood sexual abuse um, because birth can be indeed viewed as a rite of passage and it can help women heal. Um, as we said earlier, this can happen with breastfeeding as well. Uh, they can they can see that their body can actually do something good, that some that something positive can come of such a physical, such a physically demanding experience that it doesn't necessarily have to be something negative and associated with um, with previous abuse. So it is important for, for midwives to consider this angle as well. So yes, so this is basically the end. So to recap main points, as we know, uh, the prevalence of CSA is very difficult to estimate as it is substantially underreported for all the reasons we have spoken about. Um, Again, this is important to remember that survivors will often have long-term mental health consequences following their following the abuse that they have suffered. But again, it is important not to make assumptions and not to assume that all women will want or need a referral to mental health services. Uh, the theme of safety and control, so the need to feel in control and safe during the perinatal period is paramount. Um, again, it's important to remember that many survivors will not disclose, so the midwife might not know that they are looking after someone who has suffered CSA. And they may not disclose for years until adulthood, or they sometimes will not disclose ever at all. Um, important to remember the potential for re-traumatization during, um, during, during the perinatal period. And again, on a happier note, it is important to remember that sensitive midwifery care will improve birth experiences and can improve uh, outcomes for women and babies as well. And that is the end. You can see I've done my homework. There are a lot of references in there. Um, and that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much, Barbara, for that fantastic presentation and such a, such an all important topic. Well done, and thank you very much for sharing your experiences to all the midwife around the world. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Yeah, please, if you have any question for Barbara, don't forget you can send it in the chat box for her to throw some light in some areas you know clear about. Yeah. We are still waiting for the question. If you have any question, please feel free. 
to join to to send in the set it set send it in the chat box we will, we will gladly answer the question please thank you i think i may have stunned everyone into silence <laughs> no it was an amazing presentation really thank you halima <laughs> thank you very much halima for your support um in preparing for this conference you've been you've been wonderful you're welcome thank you so much also for sharing this experience to us we are so so happy i'm sure everyone is yeah everyone is happy yeah thank you for sharing this experience to us and everyone Yeah, any more question? Any question, please, we are waiting. Uh, Barbara, I have a question here. I was wondering that, are you there, please, Barbara? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. What would a midwife do with the information if a woman discloses that she has suffered a childhood sexual abuse? What do you do first as soon as she tells you that? Um. So, in my experience, the first thing that you would do is ask the woman what what she wants me to do with the information. Because again, we said that um, the feeling of being in control of, of the situation is particularly important. So I would ask her what she wants me to do with it. Um, does she want me to document it in her in her maternity notes so that staff is aware of the situation? And if if she meets other staff, they are they can be aware of her situation without her having to disclose all over again. Um, does she want me to refer her to, for example, perinatal mental health services? Or it could be a case that, um, for example, her partner doesn't know anything about it and therefore she doesn't want any mention of this anywhere because she doesn't want her partner to know. Um, it is also important to note that um, childhood sexual abuse can lead to pregnancy. So um, young girls can get pregnant from their abuse. Uh, so that, of course, opens a, a whole different scenario where uh, the partner might actually be the abuser. So in that case, uh, there, there's a whole different alleyway that we have to pursue there with um, child protection for the unborn baby, but for but for the, the woman herself, if the woman is still a child. Uh, there are situations where um, women as young as 13 and 14 years old get pregnant from their abuse and then the abuser is is the person who is then noted as the partner. Um, so it is, it, is, it is extremely important to ask the woman um, what she wants us to do and if she requires any help. Yeah, thank you very much for that. There's a question in the chat box that says, do you have any thoughts about how to address survivors with severe taboos? What are your thoughts about it? Um, so it depends, it depends on what kind of taboos are we talking about here? I mean, taboos regarding any form of sexuality or taboos regarding particular aspects of, of uh, pregnancy and childbirth. Um, I suppose it, it kind of, again, we need, we need the, the, the women in our care to lead us here because it is such it is such a huge thing um, that that we need we need guidance from the women because of course every every woman every person is going to react differently to the situation. So again, it is a question of listening to the woman's needs and um, and wishes and trying to trying to trying to work through things and trying to get to the root of things. So for example, if there is a very strong taboo regarding something, then there there must have been something strong that happened in relation to that and sometimes even just talking about it and asking the woman about it and trying to get to the bottom of where that comes from uh, might be beneficial both for the midwife and for the woman herself she might um she might realize that um that there is um uh, that there is actually something she can do to to overcome that taboo if she wants to but again, it is extremely important to um, to do what the woman what the woman um, wants us to do. Yeah, 
Thank you for that. I there's another question here, please. Um, my que the question says, how can a woman with CSA be supported if she declines a vaginal examination, and how can you assess the cervical dilatation if she de declines VE? Those are two oh. questions. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. I love that one. Um, I love that one especially because I, I I'm not a big fan of a general examination uh, in the first place for anyone. Uh, they they have their place, but um, I I prefer to assess the progress of labour by other means. So unless it is absolutely necessary, I much prefer to um, observe women's behaviour during labour, um, there are lots of other physical cues and clues that that can um, that can make you um, that can make you suspect that um, labour is indeed progressing. So, uh, I will quite often observe, often observe women's behaviour. So, how she behaves during the contractions and in between contractions. Um, we often do this um, in in Scotland. Um, we do. Um, telephone triage a lot of the time so women do not actually come in to be assessed in labour straight away as uh, the first stop will be telephone triage so if a woman phones in we listen to how she behaves during contractions we listen to how she's talking to us how she's breathing what she says and that will often give us an indication of whether we need to invite her in for 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 an assessment because we think she's in labour so um, if a woman needs to stop what she's doing drop what she's doing and just concentrate on her contraction and is goes into a little bubble and is unable to hear us unable to hear what we're saying to her during a contraction that is a very strong indication that she is probably in active labor um if a woman again this this is not universal because of course every every woman and every labor is different but it is very important to listen to what women say and to what women don't say um i also use the purple line between the buttocks to um to assess um to assess uh, progression of labor so this is particularly good to use for example if the woman is on all fours or if you're in um in a water birth situation, uh, you can you can often see a purple line between the woman's buttocks that lengthens as dilatation progresses. Um, I remember Diane Garland, who is here actually, um, telling me something about the temperature of the legs. Diane, I I, I I will ask you to clarify this for me because I cannot absolutely cannot remember what it was, but it was something about the temperature of the legs. There's there's a, a line in the leg. There's a, a some point in the leg that becomes cooler as labor progresses i believe i cannot remember i'm so sorry diane but i remember you telling me about that and of course other cues such as red show which can be an indication that birth is imminent um the woman uh, transition transition um transition stage between the end of the dilation stage and the beginning of second stage of labor can you know it can be very evident women can be and become distressed or um, they can sometimes there is nausea and vomiting sometimes women will actually fall asleep for a few minutes and then wake up again with um, with uh, stronger expulsive contractions it's important to listen as well because of course there can be involuntary pushing uh, when when birth is imminent you can hear you can hear grunting. Um, a very strong indication that birth is imminent, again, is women saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, or I want an epidural, or I want a section, I want pain relief, I can't do this, I want to go home, and that is usually when a baby appears. So there is absolutely a wealth of ways in which we can ex uh, in which we can assess the progress of labour without having to resort to a vaginal examination. Sometimes I feel that when I do perform a vaginal examination, it is merely confirmation of what i already thought so it absolutely can be done yes barbara thank you very much uh one last question please someone mm -hmm. just someone just asked from your experience is there any language that one can use to ask a csa woman about if she has been abused as a child from your experience any language one can use yeah okay so um in Scotland, and in particular in in um, in my part of Scotland where I work, I know it's not universal, but um, here we have um, electronic maternity records, um, which have a checklist, 
when it comes to the booking appointments. And one of the questions of the checklist is to ask about adverse childhood events. Now, I never word it that way because I never just outright ask the closed question, have you suffered adverse childhood events? Because that gets you absolutely nowhere. Um, I tend to ask about their childhood. I ask if they had a happy enough childhood or if anything unpleasant happened to them as a child. And, you know, it's not universal, but that works for me. I have had people disclose um, when I when I word it that way because it's it's an open-ended question which gives them the opportunity to word things in their own way and you know adverse childhood events such sounds like such a horrible thing and it, it is not it is not a welcoming sort of language so i much prefer um i much prefer translating that into you know um w was there anything not very nice that happened to you as a child and that that is you know also because you know, they, they might not consider what has happened to them to be a child, a, an adverse childhood event as such. So they might not respond if you if you pose the question like that. So I sort of rephrase it. And that has worked for me. I have had I have had um, women disclose to me when I phrased the question like that. So again, um, it is important to tailor the language, of course, to to the person that that is that is sitting in front of you at the, at the booking appointment. This, of course, is um, in the checklist for the booking appointment. But as we said earlier, some women will not disclose at the booking appointment. So it's it's important to give the opportunity further on in the pregnancy, you know, to, to sort of leave the opportunity open um, for for women to to disclose further on. Thank you very much, Barbara.